Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, cognizant classic research picks, guess the odds, a full preview, powered by FantasyNational.com, FantasyNational.com slash Mayo, to get yourself 20% off. That's what I would recommend to do, and that happens at every single membership level, the weekly, the monthly, the annual membership, it doesn't matter what it is, if you use FantasyNational.com slash Mayo. Tons of tools, all updated as of right now, plus more to come in the very near future, so get yourself in there. Fool around a little bit and try to do your own research because some things you'll see on the screen, you'll see that I don't notice because there's not possibly a scenario where I could actually see everything going on and do all the proper research. But so many people have told me with this show in particular that they'll see me doing the walkthrough. I'll be talking about one thing, but there's another thing on the screen and they'll notice that. Then they'll jump over to their Fantasy National account and do the research on that end. So that's really the joy of this show is that people find things that even I'm not talking Talking about. Hence why people like the video version over the audio version. Although I recommend that you tune into both. Sub to the Mayo Media Network on YouTube and sub to the Mayo Media Network and specifically the Pat Mayo Experience on Apple Podcasts and Spotify that really helps us out a ton. Leave a review if you're feeling good about everything. I should have the Listener's League link on Monday's show with Jeff. I'm back from vacation. Hopefully, Jake Knapp can hold on to this lead and we actually hit a winner for the first time all year. Wouldn't that be nice? So I just you know, after he was up by six at one point on Saturday, it's like, oh yeah, here we go. It's going to hurt even more when he loses this on Sunday. But the lead, I, I'm filming this before the conclusion of the third round, but Nap started going a bit sideways, a bit wonky on the back nine. So hopefully Wacky Vallabacky can do everything that he normally does when I bet on him on the Euro Tour and absolutely gag it away as well. And then, you know, they both go in with like seven shot cushions and hopefully Nap can pull it out. So we'll see where we are on Monday. Hopefully it's a joyous Monday and we've all hit winners. Wouldn't that be nice? But let's talk about the now Cognizant Classic. No longer the Honda. Honda was a the longest running sponsor on the PGA Tour for the last 42 years. It is now gone at PGA National. Cognizant is in, which is some sort of weird New Jersey tech firm, I suppose. And the field is slightly stronger than it normally is, only because Rory is playing, Matthew Fitzpatrick is playing, and Tom Kim are playing. It's Tom Kim's debut at the tournament. Fitz hasn't played since, I think, 2018. Rory hasn't played since 2019. He did win this event over a decade ago, lost in a playoff the year after, and has been, like, kind of horrible in his three starts since. Two missed cuts, a T60 or something like that. But it's been, you know, over a half decade since he actually teed it up at PGA National. So we'll see where he's coming at now. The field overall, it's 144 players. There was one big change, at least according to the scorecard. I don't know if this is going to hold or not. I'll see when the... I mean, it is the official scorecard. It looks like number 10, which was previously the second most difficult hole on the course. A really long, over 500-yard par 4 has been extended by 30 yards and changed into a par 5, thus making this a par 71 now. And when you see the scoring records, like last year... Chris Kirk beat Eric Cole in a playoff at minus 14. That was the lowest score to par since I think Camillo Vizegas won at minus 13 in 2010. Um, and I would expect that, you know, with an extra par five. And I mean, it's not going to be the easiest par five in the world, but guys are going to make eagles. Guys are going to make birdies that I would anticipate this being over minus 15, unless the weather really gets dialed up to 11. We know that there's a ton of wind. Rain can play a huge factor. Just ask Shane Lowry two years ago when he lost to Seb Straka on the 18th hole when Straka got to play it in the nice clear daylight, and then it was pouring rain by the time that Shane Lowry had to go play the hole. So the elements can most definitely play a factor this week in Palm Beach Gardens, but... I would expect the scoring to be a bit more generous, and it does actually change the way that the DraftKings Showdown Mini Edge actually works. You can read about all of that in my column, and I'll get to it when we go over the scorecard as well. But uh, my free column, it's in my free newsletter, uh, Mayo Media newsletter on Substack. If you're just searching for it or just hit the description and you can sub to it for free. You know, we have over 21,000 people subbed to that newsletter. I'd like to get that up to, I don't know, 50,000 or something like that. So please do it for me. Let me steal your email address. Share it around. Uh, if you see the article pop up, it should be out on Monday afternoon after I record the show with Jeff. So let's do that. Let's take a look at the course. PJ National, most of us know it pretty well. It's been the site of this tournament since... 2007 and we're going to get into the bear trap we're going to get into some of the other hardest holes but 
It's not a complete direct flight across the country from the Genesis to the PGA or to PGA National anymore. We did have a brief stop in Mexico, but that's still going to be a bit of a different scenario here. There was no water on the course at Riviera. There is a ton of water on the course at PGA National. It's now a par 71, 70, 147 yards. Bermuda grass greens. First time we've seen those since Hawaii, and they're actually kind of completely different. 7,000 square foot greens. That's about average for the PGA Tour. A bit on the higher side. 60 bunkers around the course. Water in play on 15 of the holes. The water and the sand combo do make this an extremely difficult scrambling course. So the green regulation rate is only 16, 60%. Uh, the tour average is like 66%. And the historic scrambling percentage is just 50 5%. That's really low. And normally you would assume that short game would be the defining trait of all of the winners at PGA National because of the scrambling, but you're not really thinking about scrambling in the proper context. Yes, being solid around the greens is always going to be important. This we know. Unsurprisingly, no amount of chipping wizardry can mitigate some wet tee shots. A missed green regulation this week doesn't mean you're trying to get it up and down from 15 yards off the fringe. Yes, that might be one of the scenarios, but it could be just as likely you're trying to get it up and down from a buck 75 away after a drop. Not every time, obviously, but I'm always thinking of the worst case scenarios when it comes to my golfers. The omnipresent agua lurks menacingly, much like a, you know, a mysterious neighbor in a kid's movie, except the water at PGA National doesn't secretly have a heart of gold. It's built on squares on the scorecard, crooked numbers. It's unforgiving. There are two ungodly difficult stretches on the scorecard. And yes, that's plural. Difficult stretches. There's the bear trap, which we all know about, 15, 16, and 17. It gets its own dedicated TV feed. It has its own statue. Everyone knows how tough that's going to play. But holes five, six, and seven actually play as a more difficult three-hole stretch. Since 2007, uh, each of them finished right around... 0.64 strokes over par as a stretch. Give or take a few strokes, that makes them the third most difficult and the fourth most difficult three-hole stretches on the PGA Tour. For non-majors, of course. Six, seven, five, six, and seven doesn't have a catchy name like the bear trap, but when you see where your guys blew up, they shot an 80, it's more than likely on those holes. The bear trap is like death by a thousand paper cuts. Well, five to seven just kind of yank you off the page. It's never good. So take a quick gander how your guys are doing after number seven, and you might be in the clear. Unless you're Ryan Palmer. Ryan Palmer's making his 500th career start this week. He is the worst player in the history of the bear trap. He is an ungodly 48 over par. He was actually one under in the bear trap in the first round a year ago before he played... 15 and 17 at five over with two water balls uh, in the second round to miss the cut. This is annually one of the toughest courses on the PGA Tour. Water's in play on 15 of the holes. As I mentioned, over 6,400 balls have plunged into the water since moving to this course in 2007. Um, it's just, you need to be somewhat lucky and you need to be, it's weird because Bombers have actually had a lot of success at this tournament. Outside of the Matt Jones year, the Matt, the, I mean, that was such an outlier tournament anyway. Matt Jones just went crazy on everyone. But that year, let me scroll up here. I have it in my notes. Uh, scoring was tough. Jones didn't do... 17 of the top 18 finishers gained in good drives that week. But six of the top 12 finishers actually lost distance on the field, but they all gained on fairways. But when you start thinking back to some of the other finishers, be it Sungjae or, I mean, Sungjae more of an accuracy guy over a distance guy. Still plus distance, but not by a lot. Then you have like Keith Mitchell, who beat Brooks down the stretch. Justin Thomas, even Ricky at the time that he won. Straka. Chris Kirk kind of shifts back the other way. Shorter off the tee. Fantastic with his wedges. So you can kind of pair up players in different ways. From that regard, if they're shorter, you know, they need to be really good from 125 and in, 100 and in, and 75 and in. You can go look at those buckets on Fantasy National if you really want to. Uh, but the Bombers just have an easier time. And because there are forced layups at this course, then we're going to be looking at different things where the accuracy improves on some of the Bombers, whereas they still have 
you know, shorter irons into, like if they hit a three wood or an iron off the tee, uh, and it's, they're all trying to get into the forced layup area as even some of the short hitters, then all of a sudden they still have a shorter iron into the green. And it just really comes into play on the par fives and some of the longer par fours where it's just a lot easier to hit a five iron than trying to hit like a five wood into some of these things. And that's where you're really going to get your scoring. You need to be able to handle the long par threes, avoid the water, uh, especially on the par threes, and really take advantage of the par fives. And that's just how this tournament goes every single year. And just make sure that you don't putt yourself out of the tournament, much like Justin Sir a year ago, where he finally had his like one amazing ball striking performance last year. And the guy was like the best putter on the PGA Tour. And he just bled strokes on the green. He came in fifth because his tee to green was so good. It's just funny. That's how it works out. The one week that you actually need him to putt to win a tournament, he just can't do it. The cut line for this tournament, 144 players, by the way, uh, it's been plus two, plus three, plus two, plus four, plus three, plus six the past six years with an extra par five. I mean, the overall score isn't going to change. You're still going to shoot what you're going to shoot, but relative to par, I would expect to see maybe even, maybe plus one, a little bit lower than it's been in years past, just because to par, it's going to be a little bit easier. So let's jump over to FantasyNational.com right now and take a look at the scorecard. It's not going to be completely uh, what we recognize here because we have not updated it because the official official scorecard has not come out like it will on Monday. We just have the first look at it right now. So number 10 is still playing as a par 4, 508 yards. It's the second most difficult hole on the course but if that changes to a par five that's 540 it's gonna be like the third easiest hole on the course where you see like a 7.1 percent birdie rate that's gonna be like a it'll probably end up being like a four percent eagle rate something like that which will maybe actually make it the easiest hole on the course maybe it probably won't end up being that high they'll you know, make some sort of concession to how that hole was redone uh, to drop the eagle rate maybe a more difficult pin position but you're probably gonna see I don't know, a birdie rate of 25 percent plus which maybe even higher, maybe like 35, which will put it on par with number three and number 18, the par fives, which are the two easiest holes on the course. The DraftKings Showdown mini mix that I told you about, the mini hack, it used to be you really wanted to start on number 10 because you would, you know, maybe you birdie, you know, 11% birdie rate uh, in the bear trap on number 17, get lucky there. 18 is the second easiest hole on the course. Number one is was the third easiest hole on the course. So you have these back-to-back ones with a birdie percentage of 32% and 17%. And then you would have to just kind of get lucky on number two. It had a 12% birdie rate or happened to get lucky on number 17. Whereas you would run into this like brick wall on number 10 being so difficult with the lowest uh, birdie or better percentage on the course at 7.1%. Now that's shifted to a par five, you actually have a nice little lead in with eight, nine, and 10. Uh, they're two of the five easiest holes on the course, and you might get number 10 as one of them as well. So you get three of the six easiest back to back to back. So starting on number one, all of a sudden is probably where you want to be. Now, if it doesn't end up being a par five, despite what it says, you can never believe. That's the only thing I'm hesitant about here is that you can never believe the PGA Tour when they announce something because it just might be false. Uh, Because sometimes they don't seem to have a clue what they're doing. Uh, The four Par threes, uh, obviously you have the very two tough ones on the back, although they're the two shortest ones, just a ton of water uh, and it'll get you. But all of them have a bogey percentage of over 15%. Uh, the double or worse rate on number 15 is over 8%, and over it's 7% on number 17. The double or worse rate is a little bit more mitigated on five and seven, although they're the two longer ones. You just don't see a whole lot of birdies at that. Just a very, if you can make your pars, get out of dodge, very high bogey percentage, but that's what you'll see. If you can tread water on the par threes at this course, you're gonna have a good time, because the par fives are not difficult at all. Even when we take a look at the par fours, you'll see, like, not many of them are super long. All the ones, I mean, number two plays about average on the course, slightly over par, but then you have number 11, you have number 14, number six, and those will absolutely eat your lunch when it comes to trying to score. So just try to tread water on all of these holes and all of a sudden you're going to be in a great situation. If you can make birdie, I mean, going into it, going into last year, if you can just kind of play the entire course even and birdie all of the par fives throughout the week, you end up at minus eight. Like, that's not a terrible score. I'm just trying to think. Like, that would have won. Like, Sungjae won at minus six. Keith Mitchell won at minus nine. Thomas, when he beat Luke List in that playoff, won at minus eight. 
So Adam Scott won at minus nine. Harrington won at minus six. Now, last year, minus 14 was a huge outlier. 14, minus 10, minus 12. The past three or so, maybe it was getting a little bit easier as the setup goes, and it should be a bit deeper again with an extra par five on the card. But you know, just dominating on the par fives should have you at basically at least inside the top five <laughs> throughout the course of the week. So just dominate those, and uh, you'll be off to the races just a little bit. Overall, the par threes, uh, as I mentioned, all of them had a bogey rate over 15%, a birdie rate under 12%. Kirk bogeyed number 17 on Thursday, but that was the only stroke he'd drop on his way to victory uh, on the par threes a year ago. So that's kind of how he got the job done. The par fours, number six, as we talked about, it can be a day runner. It has a double or worse rate of 7%, which is just kind of crazy. Uh, Kirk was minus one on number six a year ago. It's just funny that that's, those are the two key things. Tread water on the par threes actually played the most, what will probably end up being the most difficult hole now, number six at minus one, and it's going to be hard to beat you. Uh, Eric Cole almost got us that huge cash last year, just couldn't get it up and down on the playoff to end up winning it. But uh, that's where, or was it on the 72nd hole? Now I can't even remember. I remember Kirk lodged behind the tree in the playoff and then chipped it out into wedge range and put it to like a foot and made his birdie and that was the end of it. I think Cole couldn't get it up and down on that one. But he had a chance to get it up and down on the 72nd hole and missed the putt. That sucked. Uh, yeah, so when we kind of take a look at how the course plays itself out, we see that, you know, the longer, you'd think that this would be a course that had, because you know, it was a par 70, it's only 7,100 yards, you'd think it would lean more towards the shorter approaches, but it really doesn't. Like the plurality still come from 175 to 200. There's a lot of 200 plus, almost 20% on the course, uh, and then 50 to 175. So 150 plus, I mean, that's not crazy to think about, but it is interesting that 175 to 200 is the, where the main bucket actually comes from. And a lot of that has to do uh, with the driving distance. At this course, as you can see, at 273, as I mentioned, off the tee versus the average tour driving distance of 284. And like even when we saw, I think it was Phoenix. I can't remember if it was Phoenix or if it was Torrey Pines, where the average drive is like over 300. It was Phoenix, where it's over 300 yards. This one really swings back the other way. Uh, the average GER proximity of the hole is lower than it is for your average tour event, but you only hit the green, you know, 50, 60% of the time. So you hit the greens greens and regulation far less scrambling as i mentioned down at 55 percent driving accuracy a little bit lower uh and the cut line again always kind of over par it's never been under par it hasn't even been even since the time it's went to pj national in 2007 but let's jump over to to see how the tournament history has done at this course over the years and when we try to take a look back at how chris kirk we can take a look at how he got it done in a second but let's just kind of review everything that went down the past few years kirk beat eric cole in his playoff his 62 on friday was the round of the tournament it carried him it is the only round where he actually beat eric cole for the entire tournament the four best putters in the field all cash top five paydays uh, the other guy was justin sue who <laughs> came in fifth despite dropping a ton of strokes on the green so kirk cole duncan and lowry lowry has finished top five at this event each of the past two years as has seb straka and you see lee hodges has finished inside the top 14 each of the past two years as well. That's the three best over the past two years of anyone in this tournament. Substraka beat Lowry coming down the stretch. Don't forget that's the year that Daniel Berger, I think he gagged a five-stroke lead going into the final round, and it was just it was bad news if you had money on Daniel Berger. It was just heart-wrenching to see. But Berger does have three top four finishes in seven career starts at this tournament, and his driving and irons were actually quite good in phoenix from what we saw we didn't get like his, you know, we didn't have great stats uh from the american express but he beat up on the easy courses that week at farmers on the south course he dropped a bunch of strokes uh with his approach the chipping hasn't been very good however he was 14th in approach in phoenix he gained off the tee the most since he's returned from his 18 month layoff because of his back injury and that was only with like a marginal gain on the green 0.6 strokes gained on the green in phoenix he dropped almost three around the greens now over the course of his career he's been around break even but when we take a look at how he's done at the former honda classic uh, in his career just look at how many strokes he's gained putting at this event he's got these greens figured out gained in six of his seven 
starts at this tournament and in each of his past five starts he's gaining almost three strokes putting on the greens gains off the tee every single year uh that he's played it uh and even approach has been very good and rarely does he drop a ton of strokes around the green he did in 2017 but outside of that his worst performance was his t4 in 2020 0.2 0.2 strokes, not that big of a deal. Generally, he's around break even or positive. So obviously, I'm going to like Daniel Berger this week. It all just kind of depends on what his number comes in at. And we guess the odds. He was kind of the hardest one to figure out uh, towards the end. You can see uh, there's Alex Noren. He finished T5 in 2022. And obviously, he had just missed the playoff the year that Justin Thomas ended up winning in 2018 as well. Seb Straka won at minus 10 in 2022. That beat Shane Lowry by one stroke. He was seven off the lead after Thursday, but fired a 64 on Friday. I know a lot of people bet him pre-tournament. Not me, because I never hit winners. And a lot of people actually re-upped on him after the first round because I believe if we go and take a look at it and try to effort this a little bit I'm pretty sure he gained a bunch T to green that year and was absolutely putrid on the greens I don't have that and let's just switch that over to the strokes gain model just for a second so I can see each of the ones that I'm looking for here at PGA National let's tune into SD Straka Comes third in the model in the strokes gain model rank coming into this tournament at just this course. But actually, that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is his 18 rounds at this course, the year that he won, 2022, first round. I guess not. Why was everyone on him? No idea why. But he ended up just turning it on with the putter after that. I have no idea why people were live bidding him. Maybe his number was super large. I mean, I guess there's a reason that I didn't do that. But uh, yeah, the minus seven in round two is really going to go a long way. So retract that from the record. But I do remember people live betting him after that round. Again, not quite sure why, but maybe he was heating up. Maybe it was early in the second round when he was going on a birdie streak and, the, and everything hadn't adjusted as of yet. Can't quite remember. My, my memory's foggy coming off of vacation. For the top seven in proximity, 200 plus to the hole, finished inside the top 10. And of the 24 finishers, 22 of them gained on approach. Only Lowry and Kitayama. Uh, Lowry and Kitayama were top three in approach uh, on the final leaderboard. You can see Kitayama was... Oh, Kitayama's not in the field this week, so he's not going to show up on this list. Uh, in 2021, I think this is the biggest outlier year that we've had because Matt Jones, who has left for live, beat Brandon Haggy by five strokes. C.T. Pan, Denny McCarthy, Russell Henley all finished inside the top five. You got some Sam Ryder up there. Ryder's been top 10 in each of his past two starts at this course. Did not play it a year ago. You see Vegas like makes the cut almost every single year here as well. Uh, kind of up and down this week in Mexico. Hopefully he can finish strong on Sunday. Not that I have a placement on him. I would just like to see him continue to play a little bit better. We'll take a look into his stats. We can actually take a look into his stats right now just at PGA National. Tune into Vegas. Just see how he's done putting over the years. I assume it must be pretty good. He gained six in one round. It's been up and down, but overall, you see some big negatives on there, but generally very positive at this course uh, over the years. So good for Johnny Vegas. You know, I, I'm such a slut for Johnny Vegas. Eh, he's just going to cost me money. I think I bet on him like five times a year, every year for the past 10 years. I don't think he has a win since like 2008 or something crazy like that. So he just bleeds money. He did cash that each way at the 3M last year or two years ago, whenever that was, when I was big on him. So maybe that copy back to even on him lifetime. But this is yeah, the Matt Jones here. He shot a 61 in the first round and basically just cruised the entire way. That was his only round better than 68 the entire week. Uh, but he didn't card anything worse than 70. And just, it was never in doubt the entire week. It was kind of crazy. Six of the top 12 finishers, as I mentioned, lost distance off the tee that year. But yeah, I, I think that's more of an outlier year to look at. It was a very, very weak field that year as well. Sung Jay, the year that we had the DFS open right before COVID started, the week before COVID, uh, many people will joke that the DFS open started COVID. I didn't get it until like two years later. So I, I guess it didn't happen there. That was a lot of fun. Shout out to Bearoff and Joe Idone who put that whole thing together. I'd love to do it again if someone else wants to organize it. But I think this is more or less what we're going to see this year with the way that it was set up with maybe more of an emphasis on what we saw from the par fives. It was minus six. So it played a bit more difficult. And you have a lot of your difficult course players. Sung Jay wins at minus six. He beat Mac Hughes who got like the most ridiculous relief ever on the 72nd hole. Ben Ann 
uh, finished T4 that year. Berger, Henley, Woodland, Hubbard, like Hubbard this week coming in, obviously playing some great golf. Hubbard's made us pass four cuts at this tournament as well. Bob Shelton, Mad McNeely, Ryan Palmer, there he is. Shane Lowry, Lowry's good at this course. Not great, but good at this course. Vegas, Straka, Poston. Uh, Bo Hossler, just a lot of the guys that are playing in the tournament this time around are there. Uh, Bud Cully as well. How did Bud Cully? Bud Cully actually did pretty well in Phoenix in his first start in like half a decade or whatever the hell it was. He ended up coming, he wilted over the weekend, but it was nice that he made the cut and a lot of it was just putting related. As we saw with Zawa Torres in his first start back and even Berger in his first start back, chipping and putting seem to be the things that come around a little bit longer, you know, more pressure filled uh, and it's hard to replicate on the range. And even we saw it from Tiger that the chipping and putting and a shank or two, uh, it's hard to replicate that in practice rounds. You need to get real actual rounds in before that starts to come back. So we'll see how he ends up doing. I have no idea if he played in Mexico or not because, you know, I didn't do the fullest amount of research. I just knew I wanted to bet bombers and Jake Knapp appeared at the top of the list and I had my Tony Finau future, which probably isn't going to win. Uh, Sung Jae was 66 on Friday. This was one that we actually live bet because we didn't, I didn't turn on my Wi-Fi in because I was sitting, I remember sitting next to Tambo. We had bet 365 accounts as we were just kind of talking everything through after the first round. And we were both able to not connect to Wi Fi from our cell phones, turn off geolocation. So it just thought that we were back where we're from. We were able to re up on Sung Jay like 80 to 1 after the first round. That was awesome. Uh, but I, don't, I think that the gambling services have gotten a bit more savvier uh, over time than that. And they don't allow you to do that anymore. What else happened? Uh, the top 16 finishers all gained on approach. Five of the top seven in approach all finished inside the top 10. 14 of the top 16 gained in proximity from 175 to 200. The key par- proximity range. 19 of the top 20 gained strokes on par three. So these are all things that we can look at in 2019. Killa Keith got his win over two guys that I bet. Ricky Fowler and Brooks Kepka. I think I had three bets that week. Those were two of them. I think this was the year either Palmer or the Glove. Or maybe it was Brennan Steele. It was like plus six or seven on Friday and rallied to make the cut. What a hero, hero performance that was. You see, Russell Henley is a former winner at this event. He hasn't played each of the past two years, but had two top tens and a top 20 the three years previous. And this was the site, I believe, because he won at Sony. He won here. Yeah, it's just part of like the loop that Russell Henley does really well. And it was back in like 2012 or something like that. Back before like I actually have like in-depth breakdowns of everything. 14 of the 15 finishers all gained strokes off the tee. Furick was the only one who was an exception to that that year. And what else? Four of the top six gained on the field from 175 to 200 and proximity from 200 plus. So that's what's happened at this tournament over the years. When we start taking a look at the field itself, I'll click back over to my model for PGA National, which probably needs a little bit of updating, to be perfectly honest with you. And we'll do that as we get to that part of the show. Rory Fitz and Tom Kim are your top players in the field in terms of world ranking, but screw the world ranking. They're not even fair to people on live. I don't really care. Uh, Those are the three best players in the field. Uh, You also have Cam Young, Seb Strocker, Chris Kirk, Sungjae. Those past three were winners at this course in the past. Minwoo. I feel like Minwoo. I bet Minwoo at this tournament last year. And I think he just dropped a bunch of strokes putting, if my recollection has it. But, you know, that hasn't always been good for me. Let's see. Honda. No, he he lost strokes. He actually played pretty well. Gained a bunch off the tee, as he want to do. Gained a bunch putting, as he's want to do. This is like his best approach week ever. Plus plus 0.6 and blood a bunch around the greens. His approach is like actually worrisome. It's horrendous. And you think he would be better, but just he's driving and putting. He set up a lot like... I don't want to say prime Bryson because prime Bryson was awesome, but it's one of those events where he just needs to like crack, like right around like 0.2 strokes and have one of his outlier spike weeks off the tee and on the greens and boom, he's off to the races. That's what you're looking for from Min Woo. He might be overvalued going into this event, to be perfectly honest. Uh, Rose is back. Connors, Lowry, Henley, Ben Ann. I like a look for Connors. I don't recall him like ever playing here. He does rank out pretty well in the modeling, but I just, he's played well in Florida over the course of his career. Let's see. And yeah, the ball striking is about where it's always been. It's been very good. It's trending back upwards. That's always nice to see. Can't putt for shit, but that's nothing new as he played Honda. Yeah. Just constantly bleed strokes on the green. Great. It's funny that he actually puts well at API. You'd think that he would play better at this tournament because, you know, he's so accurate off the tee. Uh, you know, his long irons are really good. 
I don't know what it is. I guess, I guess you can't build much momentum when you putt like shit all the time. Ben Ann, Russell Henley, Shane Lowry all playing. Berger, Rasmus Hoygaard is in the field. This is his first PGA start of 2024. He's played on the DP World Tour five times so far. He hasn't finished worse than T11. It's his first time in the tournament. His best finish was a second at the Raz Al Kalahad Championship, where he lost to Thor Bjorn Olesen, who just got a Masters invite, and Thunder Bear won that tournament. He played in Mexico this week. He made the cut. No idea how he's doing over there, but he went T8, T21, and a win through the Middle East swing to kick off the DP World Tour. Uh, he's making his tournament debut, so another guy who might be buried a little bit in the, let's see, in the odds board. Let's see, Thor Bjorn Olesen, Thunder Bear. And see how he's doing. Uh, other guys that are in the field of reference like Hostler, List, Ricky, Eric Cole, Ryan Fox, Mathieu Pavon, the leader in the FedEx Cup standings, is in the field again this week. Rose and Pavon skipped the Genesis to play this event, which I just thought was really weird. Uh, and this used to be the site where a lot of the internationals, and Euros especially, used to make their first PGA start. But with the signature events, a lot of the top guys just come over and play now anyway. So we take a look through Thor, Bjorn, Olison on the PGA Tour. Uh, you know, nothing much to write home about. He had that nice run. When the hell was it? The match play. He won the World Cup in 2016 when he knocked out Tiger uh, in the quarterfinals, I think it was. Whenever the hell that was. I think it was 2019. Yeah, and Tiger ended up winning the Masters and Thunder Bear, you know, was around in some of these tournaments. Has never really made a mark outside of that one tournament on the PGA Tour. Dietrich's playing this tournament for the first time in his career. Svensson, EVR, a lot of water for EVR, so watch out on that front. Gim Reaper, Poston playing. I mentioned Mark Hubbard. Vegas is back. Davis Thompson's been playing some decent golf as of late. Michael Kim, our guy, playing in this tournament. So a, a lot. Uh, of decent players. I actually think this is a little bit better than it's been in the past. I did say that we would take a look at the strokes gained from last year as well. You can see Chris Kirk, 9.2 strokes tee to green. It was Su, Lowry, Brandon, woo, David Lingmurth, Chris Kirk. Those are the top five tee to green. Ryan Gerrard, the Monday qualifier, uh, did really well. MJ Duffy, who had a really nice first round in Mexico coming off injury, uh, did not have a very good round two or round three. I think he was DFL of all guys that made the cut when I checked on Saturday. Uh, in terms of approach, it was Wallace. Where's Wallace? Wallace ended up like winning like two weeks later. He, yeah, in like Corrales or Putacan or wherever the hell it was. Uh, and then played really well in Texas too, I believe. Brandon Wu, Straka, Kyle Stanley. Kyle Stanley, good for him. He tried to qualify for Liv this year. Didn't qualify. Uh, Lingmurth, and we take a look at the putting. That's where it really came through. Ben Taylor, fifth place. Eric Cole, second place. Anders Albertson gained 8.3 strokes putting. He came in 63rd because he couldn't do anything else. Ben Martin, fifth. T Dunks, third. They all gained over six strokes putting. Then you had Chris Kirk gain 5.6. That was good enough uh, to have himself come through. Maybe if Johnny Vegas could have like chipped the ball okay, he would have been fine as well. And that's what we looked at a year ago. Let's dig in to the modeling to see if we can unearth some decent players this time around. So one thing that I do want to change, we'll take a look at how I had it set up in the past. So approach at 25, ball striking, driving distance and fairways gained. So that's my version of total driving, two thirds for distance, one third for fairways gained. Uh, instead of putting in total driving, that's what I have. Opportunities gained for actual scoring purposes. Par fours, par fives, proximity 175 to 200 at 5%. Proximity 200 Plus, I'll have all of this in my newsletter if you want to, if you're listening to the audio version and trying to see it. I'm going to throw putting into this mix as well. So I'm going to throw in SG putt. Uh, and I actually have a putting model set up that we'll look at here in a second. Just kind of weight that out, you know, 6%, whatever it might be. We could probably tone down approach a little bit to 21%, only because I have opportunities gain and two proximity ones in there too. So yeah, opportunities gain, that, that looks pretty good to me. Let's update the model and see who it pops out over the past 24 rounds at all courses. Rory, Pendrith, Hoagie, who didn't help Pendrith this week, Eric Cole, EVR, Svensson, Poston, Gim Reaper, Mathieu Pavon, and Davis Thompson. Those are the top 10 for the week. Uh, Mark Hubbard, Luke List. I like Hubbard coming in. I think he, I feel like he, he, had some spike performances. I think he had a pretty good like approach round going in Mexico. That's something I can review more. And when I have the update for the newsletter, it'll have all the updated stuff from Mexico because we actually do have strokes gained from there. Yeah, it was at Pebble. Got himself into Pebble. 
you know, did, did putt pretty well, dominated in the south course at Farmers. That's really crazy. And actually had good good approach and good chipping in Phoenix, despite the putting not being there, but has played pretty well, as I mentioned, at Honda over the years. 42nd, 15th, 46th, 11th, like every other year. Fortunately, this is the other year, so hopefully he can get that going. Mark Hubba Hubbard, my guy. Hopefully he uh, ends up doing something here. Who else is down here? Connors, Kirk, Sebez. This on paper should be a really good Sebez course. It's just he's not hitting in as many fairways as you would like at the moment. But, you know, the, uh, the irons tend to be pretty good. He scores really well on par fours. Uh, the driving is just so horrendous. But he is 11th right now over the past 24 rounds in approach. That's a good look for him. Yeah, you do just think like, hey, maybe I'll dump on Rory and that will be the end of it. Tom Kim as well. I wonder how Tom Kim has been doing here. Tom Kim 16th in the model over the past 24 rounds. It seems like he's playing a lot worse than that. But 24th at the Genesis, couldn't putt. 17th in Phoenix, the approach was great. Bad at Pebble Beach, bad at the American Express, bad at the Century. But then he has some good performances. You know, he won the Shriners, so that's going to be pretty good. Interesting stuff here. All right. I don't have any like specific leans on anyone right away. Like, where does Berger rate out here? Berger, he's 32nd. The driving distance, but the fairways is driving distance bad, fairways good. That's pretty good. The bogey avoidance hasn't been good, but a lot of that can relate to putting, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, one thing that we can look at, one of the features here, the rolling model, we'll put that up. And because I don't have strokes gain total up here, we're going to go to my PGA National model and see how that does and try to see the results of the rolling report. So with everything weighted around the same, um, over the rolling model, Hoagie actually rates out the best, then Pavon, then Rory, Cole, List, Gim, Pendrith, Connors, Cam Young, Adam Svensson. That's what we're looking at here with each of the ranges from last four, last eight, last 12, last 24, 50, and 100, all weighted around the same. Um, so that's always something you can you can put in the rolling model, and then you can add this to your mixed condition model uh, by just putting in the model rank if you really want to uh, with all of that. Uh, that's one of the things that I like to do when building a mixed condition model. But I do have the mixed condition model uh, a little bit different here. Um, this time around, because when we take a look at the mixed condition model, uh, I actually did this up before the show, so it wouldn't take a whole lot of time to do. Let's go over to the mixed condition model. And it's really going to show you Bermuda putting. So I have Bermuda putting weighted at 100% in this model. But the other four categories I have are the last 12 at this course in particular in strokes game putting, the past 36 on bent grass, the past 36 on POA, and just the last 75 overall. So we can get a sense of someone who putts better on Bermuda versus some of the other surfaces. So as you can see in the top five here, McNeely, Dietrich, Ramey, Montgomery, and Justin Su. It's funny because Justin Su was so bad on the greens here a year ago, but one of the funny things about, oh, that doesn't seem like it's good at all. The guys who don't putt well here would putt really well on Bermuda. That's not necessarily the entire thing. Like McNeely had two really bad rounds. He only actually loses point zero one strokes putting per round that's good for 97th in this field Dietrich and taylor montgomery have zero rounds so they just rank 59 so they actually haven't done anything so their weighting is a little bit down ramey had two really bad rounds uh two years ago where he lost over four strokes putting but actually gained last year so one bad year is weighing him down because of the sample really small he only has four total rounds as just justin so he only has four total rounds of putting once we start getting into the other players you can see where it matches up a little bit Bit better like badly despite being a very good putter has the full complement of the rounds at this course just has never really putted all that well but you can see someone like ben griffin has a distinct split between he's eighth overall past 36 on bermuda 106th on bent 128th on POA. So that is something to kind of take a look at. Hey, Ben Griffin might be a little bit of a better look here. And when we kind of go see what his results have been like, well, the driving and approach play has been horrendous maybe that's not the look that you want to be going with with ben griffin this week but does putt a little bit better on bermuda denny just putts well overall let's see another guy who's a bit better ben taylor who did finish inside the top five a year ago 15th over the past 36 on bermuda 95th on bent grass so that's a big outlier in that way ryan fox putts better on bermuda i don't know how many total rounds that is but we can go take a look at the ryan fox portfolio here portfolio when has he done well? Well, he's gaining 0.6 strokes per round uh, on 
Bermuda, losing on Bent and losing on Poa. So you can kind of see he putted really well at the players. He putted really well at API last year. What else was Bermuda last year? Nope, nothing else. So limited rounds, but has putted well in Florida, at least over the part of his career. You'd think with his bomber status that he would be a little bit better. So we also have Patton Kazire better on Bermuda. Uh, Nicholas Echeverria has not putted well at this tournament, better on Bermuda than anywhere else. Just an abject failure on Bent and on Poa. We're not going to count po- past Powell because you get very few tournaments on those things. Um, yeah, and that's kind of it, is the guys who really stand out between the best putters over the past you know 12 rounds at this course in particular. Dylan Wu, Ben Taylor, Denny, Eric Cole, Daniel Hauser, Berger, the top five, Kirk Hodges. Uh, Keith Mitchell, Patton Kazire, Johnny Vegas round out the top 10. You also have Matthew Fitzpatrick, who has not played this tournament in ages, but still rates out really well. Have a feeling Norrin's going to be a very popular look this week, too, just based on what we've seen. So that's the Bermuda putting. We can fill out a mixed condition model however we want. Hopefully Akshay can be a little bit better, too. That would be very nice. Uh, let's take a look at the rank, take a look at the model past 24, and just see who's like the worst. If any good names are really down there, don't see anyone of like, you no, know, Fowler. Fowler rates out horrendously. However, he's been playing in more difficult tournaments where a lot of these guys haven't. They don't get Mexico. I mean, Ricky did get the American Express. Those stats aren't counted. I don't believe he played in the Sony, which was an easier tournament. So he's not piling up some decent stats against weaker fields. He's generally playing in more difficult fields. The only other thing that I would kind of take a look at here, if we just go to, I suppose we can take a look at the time machine as well. Are the time machine stats in? Yeah, Honda time machine from last year, just to see how it would have done. Sometimes it's always nice to try to double check your work to see how the model actually would have spit it out. Nick Hardy would have been number one based on these stats going into it. He did not play well. He got cut. Uh, Ben Griffin was second in the model. He ended up coming in eighth. Bramlett missed the cut, so it wasn't very good. Gordon, uh, what did he end up coming? Let's see. Oh, no, it was the MCM rank. How did he end up actually finishing? Oh, Ben Griffin was T21. Uh, Will Gordon was 42nd. Sung Jay was T42. So not a good year for the model whatsoever. We just got to kind of sort by position. We'll see. Chris Kirk was ranked 18th. Shane Lowry was ranked 8th. Ben Taylor was ranked 16th. He actually performed pretty well. He came T5. Other than that, it was just a lot of misses. Cam Percy. And that's the thing, too. There's a lot of variance at this course. When I talked to Tambo on Wednesday about it, because of all the water, you just get some really wonky results. Like, two bad shots can sink you at a tournament. That's why going back and trying to factor in too much course history is really difficult at this tournament. Let's see. Straka was 45th in the model of the year that he won. Lowry was 11th. Kidiyama came in 3rd. He was 109th. Berger was 2nd. Came in 4th. Mitchell was 8th. Came in ninth. Other than that, again, very spotty. So maybe not the best week to trust the modeling in this sense. You might want to go off the board a little bit uh, and try to just you know, take some educated guesses on either players that have putted well um, on Bermuda or played well at this course historically, but have one or two really outlier type performances in terms of missed cuts. That's what we've seen at the Players' Championship over time. Or Valspar is the one that's been a bit more sticky, but players, you have guys with like great course history. You just have horrendous, like Molinari and Paul Casey used to be the best. It'd be like, oh yeah, they're super consistent here. Oh, they came dead last this year. Because that happens from time to time. This year seems to be a little bit better. Matt Jones won. He was seven. 17th, Haggy, like no one was on. Henley ended up coming in third. Tringali was number one in the model that year. He came in 13th. Um, Sungjae was 13th, came in eighth. So yeah, so hopefully it's probably like, I'm guessing that the 2020 was probably the best model versus results tournament that there was. Let's see here. The finish. Yeah, Sungjae was 11th. He won. Fleetwood was 21st. He came in third. Woodland was 30, came in eighth. So even that year, it still wasn't all that spectacular. It had a lot of Euro guys. Though. This was the year that Steele rebounded, by the way. 2020, when he started out horrifically and ended up rebounding. Um, what else? Yeah, Ben Ann was 23rd, came in fourth. Berger was 24th, came in fourth. This one was a little bit better. Not great by any stretch of the imagination. But you do have Fleetwood played prime. I think this was his first North American start. Ditto with Fleetwood. Yeah, and I think Norn Norn was up there. I thought, and that was the year that was the year that uh, Justin Thomas won that he was up there. So he had a few euros kind of spike up. So maybe Hoygard and Hoygard, Fox, Minwoo, and Thunderbear would kind of qualify for that. Jorge Campillo is in the field this week as well, uh, just in case you were wondering. So now it's time to guess the odds for the Cognizant Classic. 
Rory is the best player in the field. He is going to be the favorite. How short is that number going to be, though? He was just behind Scotty at Riviera. I'm guessing he comes in at 7-1. to one. It could be lower than that, but in a 144-player field, not a limited field, despite the lack of overall talent at Palm Beach Gardens at PGA National. I do think he comes in at 7-1. to one. Fitzpatrick probably second at 12-1. to one. And then you have Tom Kim, Cam Young, and Sung Jae. I'm guessing round out the next three names, all sub 20-1. to one. Maybe they end up at 20, who knows. I have Tom Kim at 16, Cam Young and Sung Jae both at 18-1. to one. Then you got the 20s. I got Straka, Min Woo, Lee, Russell Henley, those three, all at 25 to 1. Then I have Connors, Lowry, Eric Cole, and Chris Kirk, the defending champion and the guy he beat in the playoff a year ago, all at 33 to 1. I also have Daniel Berger at 35. He is one of the most difficult people to try to guess this week. If the number is 40 or above, I'm betting Daniel Berger. If it's like in the 20s, which it could feasibly open as, considering he has three top four finishes in seven career starts at this course and trended up a little bit in Phoenix that maybe the books are thinking that he's back. They don't want to post a big number on him, but 35 to one, I'd probably be in on that. Who am I kidding? So yeah, 35 to one for Daniel Berger. I got Rose, Ben Ann, Bo Hossler, and JT Poston all at 40 to one. Rasmus Hoygaard, as mentioned before, 45 to one, playing his first start in America. This is not Nikolai Hoygaard. This is Rasmus Hoygaard. Five starts on the DP World Tour so far in 2024, and he has five top 11 finishes. No finish worse than 11th. Had a T2 over in the Middle East to Thunder Bear, Thorbjorn Olesen, who got a master's invite and is in the field this week too. I have him at 50 to 1 as an open. Ricky Fowler, Mathieu Pavon, the leader in the FedEx Cup standings right now. I have both at 45 to 1 as well. And then you have a bunch of guys who could be in the 40s. They could be in the 70s. I have no idea. Names like Ryan Fox and Tom Hoagie, Thomas Dietrich, Mark Hubbard, Akshay Bhatia, Jake Knapp. We'll see how he finishes in Mexico. Um, if he comes second, you know, his odds will be better than if he comes in first. He might take the week off if he ends up winning, having qualified for the Masters and the signature events all the way through. So who knows how the PGA Tour rookie is going to work. Gary Woodland in the field as well. Not quite sure how the books are going to price him. Not really playing all that great of golf coming back from his brain injury, but you know, starting to show a semblance of his former self. I'd guess he comes in probably opens at 75 to 1 and drifts towards 100. That would be my guess for the Cognizant Classic. That'll do it on the Pat Mayo Experience. Thank you all for watching. Smash like if you want to get in on Fantasy National, fantasynational.com slash mayo. Rate and review the audio podcast, or at least just sub to it if you haven't done that already. And subscribe to the free newsletter where the entire article will be too. Thank you all for watching. I'm Pat Mayo. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!